Hello and welcome back. Sean here, Mountains Garage in the beautiful state of Maine. No weather report today. Let's get right to it. <laughs> I got a well-timed viewer request to talk about tailhousings. It just so happens I'm a pan and tailhousing away from finishing this transmission that I've been picking away on in the background. And it seems, thinking to myself at first, that I couldn't fill 30 seconds talking about tailhousings, and I bet this video proves me wrong, <laughs> as they often do. So, lately I've been kind of taking each piece and breaking it down in even more detail. So that's where we're at. <clears throat> My personal favorite, and the one you'll find the most in the wild, and I prefer to if I'm going to put a Turbo 400 in something, I'm going to use the short shaft. It's four and a half inches, but slang term is a short shaft Turbo 400. It's the most popular one you're gonna find. It is the same length if you have a bolt-on yoke, if you have the big brake drum. The output shaft is correct to get yourself a two-wheel drive tail housing and convert that transmission over to a normal slip yoke. Seems easy, right? The only thing different about the tail housings that a Turbo 400 size, hang on to that, is the threads for the mounting bolt. There's only two choices. 7 16 14 or 7 16 course was used up until mid 70s and then it went to M10 1.5. So there's only two choices. And when I, I always chase the threads, it's gonna be one or the other, I can tell by looking. This is a metric one, M10 one and a half. But I run a thread chaser through it uh, and or I helicoil it, whatever I gotta do. And when I give somebody a transmission, I go ahead and supply the bolts. And I also supply the linkage nut because that can be either 3 8 course or M10 one and a half. So, I go ahead and supply the nut for the linkage and the bolts for the tail housing because I don't want my transmission getting messed up by somebody winding in the wrong bolt. As a kid, I was a fan of mailing away a dollar or two, whatever it cost, to get catalogs. And I had a Fairbanks racing transmission catalog. And in their competition transmission section, they offered two short shaft turbo 400s, large spline, which is normal turbo 400 we're all used to. And then they said small spline. I didn't know what that meant. It took me a lot of decades before I actually ran across the few and I actually have two of these tail housings. I don't have the matching output shaft, but I can tell you they look identical, but I know what you're thinking. It's turbo 350 size like the TH375. It's not the seal. It's completely different. Here's a TH375 tail housing we're gonna to get to in a minute, but the seal was, doesn't fit, but it fits here. It took me a long time one afternoon to find this seal because I thought I was going to need this whole outfit. Like I say, I have two of them, but this tail housing was stuck on another transmission core because it was wrong. So it's not TH350 size. A TH350 yoke won't fit the bushing won't fit the seal, the seal won't fit. It's, you'll, you'll find them listed, you know, probably pre-65, 64, 65, maybe 66. I believe they were Cadillac, believe it or not, because Cadillac typically had the longest tail housings. So be aware that if you see a short shaft one, to make sure it's turbo 400 size, or it's gonna be odd, and I'm trying to avoid, again, if I was to be out on the road and needed a Turbo 400, most everybody's gonna have the short shaft version kicking around in their shed. Probably not gonna find one of these, so let's just move this out of the way. At least Chevrolet or GM at the time did you a solid, and the distance between the flange and the yoke, excuse me, the mounting point for the mount is the same, including up to the late 80s, the TH375 I'm gonna talk about next. This distance is the same. Now you get the same length tail housing 
Turbo 400 size in the old Pontiacs. I'll show you one. And this mounting point is a one inch back. So again, you building yourself a white elephant. If you use anything but the traditional short shaft unit. All your GM muscle cars, well, I say all. I can't tell you about Caprice and Impala, but I can tell you Chevelle, Nova, Camaro all have the short shaft and a relatively short drive shaft. The reason why GM had to keep increasing the length of the tail housing is because they had a shaft dimension, probably 65 inches, they didn't want to exceed, maybe even 60 inches. So in their engineering department, they had to do something. They can't just shove the engine back till the drive shaft fits. So they kept increasing. This was easy for them to do, to make different length output shafts to fit different cars. That's the only reason. So let's move on to the late 80s version. You'll see it's flat on top. It looks very strange. In the you know, 80, five, six, seven, half tons. I can't tell you the exact years, but late 80s, two wheel drive pickups, probably long bed. They had this tail housing. The spline is 27 spline, TH350. A regular TH350 yoke fits in here. However, I'll show you on the transmission. There's a cup driven over the output shaft that has an O-ring in it and seals the yoke because the yoke has a pinhole in it. And it's allowed to move a little bit, but that drive shaft has a center support. In the GM two-wheel drive trucks, like the one-ton dualies and stuff, they use the short shaft with the bolt-on yoke that we're all familiar with that typically had a short shaft that went to the center support, and on the back of the center support was your slip yoke, you know, which allowed the rear end to go up and down and the drive shaft to move, but it was fixed between the bolt-on yoke and the center support. I'm sure you've been under a few trucks and you understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you wanted to build yourself a TH375 because, well, I can't think of the reason why, but you wanted to use all the junk you got laying around, I would remove the tail housing, take the cup off the output shaft, and just put a regular TH350 yoke if you have a one-piece drive shaft and you want the slip yoke to slip. That cup is not designed to slip. Again, it has an O-ring that seals the yoke, and the yoke has a pinhole in it. So uh, we've you know welded or brazed up many of the yokes to use them in something else back when we you know built vehicles out of junk. You get the car all together, and you realize it's oil leaking out of the center of the yoke, and you figure out why pretty fast. This is the late '80s, TH three seventy five, and that's the cup that goes over the yoke. It's an interesting design, but that is what GM thought was a good idea. And as promised, this is a mid-70s Turbo 400, probably out of a Pontiac station wagon. Actually, I looked it up in a video, but now I forget what it was. Well, this was the police heavy duty, so it must have been Le Mans or something like that. But this is Turbo 400 size. Looks very similar in length to the TH375, but like I mentioned, the mounting point is an inch further back from the flange. So if you're gonna use something like this, you're pretty much on your own to ever match it up. So if that is a concern, avoid it. If it isn't, do what you gotta do. Last word on the TH375, they did exist before this weird looking flat tail housing. I used to have one that was in an old 70s pickup. Somebody had swapped it in there, but it was definitely a Chevy case with the longer tail housing and a 350 sized yoke-ish. Again, I never actually measured it, but let's just assume there's some other weird combinations out there. But the ones we're familiar with and most of the transmissions you're going to find if you're shopping for cores is the old bolt-on yoke with the correct size output shaft. And the correct tail housing. All you gotta do is get rid of this bolt-on yoke. Now we've been over this many times. I machine off the O-ring groove. GM used an O-ring right here in lieu of that cup we just looked at. The yoke is counterboard. 
And the yoke is fixed, of course. It actually bolts on in the center. It's called a bolt-on yoke because there's a bolt and washer in the middle that hold it on, and the counterboard yoke is over the O-ring, and none of this ever moves. So when we want to put a slip yoke on the back of the 400, recycling this bolt-on yoke output shaft, you're going to run into a bind if you don't do something with the O-ring groove. So I machine them off. I grind them off now, actually, in the lathe. It comes out perfect, and I don't ruin all my carbide bits. So if you can spin this and you have a cordless grinder, you can do a beautiful job. It comes off ever so slowly. I find there's several different types of O-ring grooves. This one had a dual groove, so I just grind off and until the potting line disappears where the groove was and I taper it back. And there's also different versions of the tool drive output shaft. But what you need to accomplish is to get rid of the O-ring groove. Now, my yoke of choice is a Spicer, Genuine Spicer, 3-3-2431X. That's a five and a half inch yoke. 1350 series U-joint, it's not counterboard. So this would definitely run into the O-ring groove, even without the O-ring, if I was to run this without modifying the output shaft. Now, some people don't want to do any modifications. And it's also by a beware. A genuine spicer yoke will have spicer cast right into it. It'll have the pot number. It looks physically different. It looks stronger. It's thicker. Many places will guarantee you it's a genuine Dana spicer yoke and sell you the aftermarket version. That's what happened to these. I got a nice tip from a viewer. He'd found some of these for like 39 bucks, I think. And it said, Gen it was on eBay, genuine Dana spicer. I bought four of them. They showed up. They're not. There's nothing cast in, into them. They're obviously the cheap offshore replacement. Perfectly adequate for a street rod or even a hot street car. So I kept them because it was still a good deal. And actually, the I questioned the seller about the validity of his advertisement. And no questions asked, they refunded some money. And this is sold under the same pot number, 3-3-2431X. So I thought I was getting the non-counterboard version. The aftermarket offshore one has a counterboard. So in theory, you could just lose the O-ring and you could run this without it. I don't do that. But you can. The counterboard should go up over the O-ring groove, but at least take the O-ring off. I see a lot of people online, they'll take an already short yoke and cut it off and run it that way. That's a lot of work to even cut it off and make it fit again. So why not just at least get a counterboard yoke and remove the O-ring. You got to take off six bolts and get a gasket to access the O-ring to grind off the groove or machine it off. You need to remove the transmission output shaft from the transmission and it's the first piece to go in. So that's all I got to say about that. So I have these yokes right here. One for demonstration purposes, but more often this is my standard. This is a Corvette yoke. I put it in my Evaporust, and come to find out it's a very expensive yoke. But this and the 72 Corvette transmission that I picked up oh, over a year ago now is one of the ones that I can't seem to ever pot with. So it sits waiting someday for a street build we're going to do on the channel. So when I have an output shaft and I want to evaluate it, I've mentioned there's wide and narrow uh, bushings for the tail housing. This is the wide. This one has a wide and you can see the extra just hangs inside. I drive them in flush here. This is untouched. I haven't serviced this one yet, although judging by the paint job and the fact it's not dirty, this is probably usable. I haven't even checked it yet, but... I evaluated the fit, and it's actually looser than I would expect. If you put the new bushing in and it feels like that, well, you kind of got to go with it. But in this case, for ultimate discovery, I need to drive that bushing out, drive this one in, and then reevaluate. But they all should feel the same because I, 
Yeah, they all have some play, so. I believe I have to service a bushing, but it doesn't mean you always have to service this bushing. But the pump bushing, every time. This one, almost every time. Other bushings in the transmission you have to evaluate, but this isn't a bushing video. However, I'm going to iron out the bushing and then recheck the fit. I always do that before I paint it because otherwise I'm going to do damage to my wonderful paint job. So I'm going to go ahead and knock the bushing out, knock a new one in, and we'll reevaluate the fit. And I'm going to be using my new bushing drive. I won't be using the tools I've used in the past. I'm going to, again, I think I'll use the press this time. I believe this will fit in its current position. And press it in and out. The, the one bushing I always press in and out with the press is the center support bushing because it's so long. But the short ones, I typically don't have any trouble. I guess if I was really on my game, I would have had two tail housings going. I would have driven one in and out with a hammer and would have pressed one in and out. And we could have seen if the fit was different. Uh, a year or so ago, the bushings I was getting, I had to hone almost every one afterwards with a brake cylinder hone. And by the time you're done, it looks like a used bushing and probably fits about the same. So I've been on a pretty good streak lately and we're gonna find out whether this will actually fit when we're done. I have a feeling it's going to, but time will tell. All right, old bushing out, new bushing in. Moment of truth. Was it worth the effort? Ooh. Very nice, it almost pops when you pull it out. So, from here, I still need to chase my threads. It's pretty clean, but I'll wash it again. I always make sure the gasket surface is clean. When it's time to paint it, I actually hold it like, just like that, and I like to spray this direction just to get it down in here, because when I put it outside or wherever I'm gonna paint it, and I put this aluminum slug that I have that's been painted a lot, it's the same thing I use on the front pump to not get paint inside. I just set it right there and I go ahead and blast, but I can't make the paint go up uphill, so, well, from that angle. So I make sure I get up in the groove under the mount because it would drive me nuts if it wasn't, and then I paint it. Let it dry, bring it back in, and if you've watched me do anything, you know that I have a fear of this spring that actually squeezes the seal on the OD of the yoke, I have a fear of it falling out when you're beating on it, installing it. So I pack the cavity, try not to get any here, with Vaseline or assembly lube. So when I'm beating on it, that goo is gonna hold it in there. Then the red on the seal should act like a sealant, but if you want to, you can put something else there uh, the aviation former gasket with a little paintbrush, the black stuff, you paint a little around there, a little, and then carefully install the seal. I use one of my homemade drivers, and I my goal when putting a seal in is only hit it a few times. So I like to be perfectly straight and whack the hell out of it. If you hit it more than three or four times, or it's crooked, Probably got to stop and do it again because that would be an annoying leak. And while I got you here, when you're stripping the transmission and it has the tail housing on it with the seal, you probably have it upside down. I don't know what direction you have the transmission in, but one, you're gonna gonna want to remove the seal. It's a lot easier if this is bolted to the transmission. But try to avoid. The biggest mistake I always see of people, no matter what they're doing, like a rear end cover, for example, take all the bolts out and you gotta drive something up in there to break it loose. Don't drive it in from the bottom where the oil sits 24 seven. Go up higher than the oil level and tap from the side up top. The output shaft, I call this the output shaft twice now. The output, <laughs> the tail house, and my God, I don't want to redo this. I'm just going to leave the mistakes in, but I noticed maybe two minutes ago I said, called this the output shaft. The tail housing goes over the output shaft. Tap gently on this ridge right here 
and break the seal loose, and then you can go on the inside and beat it out. Most of the time, if you try beating with a screwdriver from the inside, guaranteed, one, you're going to wreck the bush, and two, you're probably just going to punch a hole in the seal because this grab is pretty good. But don't stop whacking on the bottom where there's always oil trying to leak out. So if you want a tip today, that's it. When you go to, again, it's applied force engineering or applied force technology. I typically use my favorite tool. I found this on the side of the road. It's a putty knife made to hit on, very thin, and I sharpen it like a razor blade. That won't do a seal, but if you're trying to break like a rear end cover loose or transmission pan or something, that does minimal damage and will break it loose. But you gotta think about what you're doing. You just don't start whacking on the aluminum. A lot of my tail husbands you look at, they're all beat up around the bottom where people have changed the seal because out of opportunity or convenience, I mean, that's where you are under the vehicle. Just use your head. So that's it for today. <laughs> I didn't think I could possibly talk about tail housings for more than 10 minutes, but I just did. I love my new bushing drivers. Should have had them a long time ago. Shouldn't have waited a year or so to even get them out of the box because they uh, are definitely nice. My opinion is I looked at the other tools available by the same seller on eBay and I believe these to be genuine. One, the quality is awesome. I haven't even scratched them yet. And uh, two, they sell a lot of other KD tools. So whether they're real or not, I guess I'll never know, but they work great. So that's that. Uh, it's Thursday, I guess. So uh, who knows? Might even do another video this week. We've got lots of things to cover. But this was an excellent suggestion. Thank you. And uh, the viewers are the best. I mean, the subscribers especially. <laughs> uh, I got another guy sending me a bunch of random Turbo 400 parts that he had left over. That's not, there's probably like a six person that's done that. I'm not asking, I'm not soliciting for people to send me all this stuff, but it's super nice. It's just somebody wants to do that. It blows me away. So, and uh, when I get it, I'll, you know, give the proper shout out and uh, definitely use it because, uh, yeah, I love parts. <laughs> Talk to you in a couple days.